Okay, hey everybody. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people don't feel super good about the front end part. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm here to, today to talk about. Uh, cool. Let me see if I can get this. Oh, there we go. Okay. And. Which is. Bring my speakers in. Cool. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. How are you? How are you all doing today? Like collectively, you know, S sufficient levels of caffeination in the room. Uh, people, you know, feeling reasonably spongy in their brains right now. Okay. Um, so my name is Robert Tully. I am a senior web developer for Atlantic Media in Washington D.C. And for the next half hour, I will be talking to you about front-end development for back-end developers. Uh, this talk is, of course, a follow-up to my other wildly successful presentations, including Swimming for Birds, <laughs> uh, Bicycling for Fish, and, of course, uh, Creative Writing for Professional Wrestlers. <laughs> I am, uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful to uh, DjangoCon for you for giving me the chance to give this presentation, and I am even more grateful to all of you for coming out to hear me speak. Uh, it is a huge vote of confidence that over the next uh, half hour to an hour I'll be able to fill your brains with something useful, and I promise I will do my best to live up to that promise. This presentation is sorry. This presentation is geared towards a reasonably narrow band of, uh, band of people. If you're not yet super familiar with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, this is, there's going to be parts that are going to be confusing for you. Um, if you're a core contributor to React or Vue, you are going to be extremely bored, and I will not blame it you if you want to go grab a cup of coffee or go across the street next door to go grab a quick skateboard break. Uh, that is totally reasonable, too. Uh, personally, I put myself somewhere in the middle. I've had some successes uh, building out different web applications. I built reasonably complicated web applications with Vue. Uh, recently, just deployed my first React Native mobile application. And uh, at work, I've helped uh, incorporate a couple of reasonably to moderately advanced build processes uh, for some of our Django applications. But it's been hard. It's been a very sticky process. Um, it reminded me of uh, back before I became a Django developer, I was doing most of my work with PHP. And learning Django just felt like having something fall into place. Uh, model template view architecture just made fundamental sense. Uh, the ORM was so much better than writing raw SQL. You could get something close to peace of mind when it came to database migrations using Django. Uh, the better way of doing, doing things just clicked. It wasn't that way when uh, years later I was trying to move beyond jQuery into the world of modern front end development. I was bashing my head against React, Node, and Webpack tutorials month after month. Really smart people were telling me, you know, smart people who I trusted were telling me that these tools weren't all just hype, that at the end of it, the end of this process, I was going to come out of it being able to build some truly cool, fun stuff. But I just couldn't see it. I didn't get what's, what's wrong with jQuery. Uh, why do I need these 10 different random libraries to perfectly have the moon align to play nicely with each other? Uh, do I need to give up Django if I'm going to just become a node developer? If, you know, what JavaScript is now on the back end, too. All these are uh, were really uh, confusing thoughts. And, I think they stymied my process because I was trying to uh, eat an elephant all in one bite. The goal of my talk is not to make you front-end experts, uh, but to answer these questions that developers are uh, trying to modernize their front-end skills might encounter, and to give you ways of doing it within the familiar, stable, and powerful context of a Django application. So today, we are going to talk about some ways to uh, integrate some of these tools into a Django project, and as we do so, I'm going to introduce you to a man named Will Rogers. Oh, sorry, that was, let's get that slide. Cool. I got married a few, a few months ago uh, to a woman from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, for those of you who have never heard of Tulsa or Oklahoma, if you were looking at a map of the United States, it is directly square in the middle of it. Uh, the airport in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is named after one of Oklahoma's most famous citizens, Will Rogers. Not to be confused with uh, Fred Rogers, the man who was uh, behind Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, 
Will Rogers was a cowboy philosopher. Uh, he did perform, he got on horses and spun lassos and performed and did tricks while just stream of conscience uh, talking about what was on his mind. And eventually people uh, started just listening to the things that he had to say and he didn't really have to get up on the horse anymore. He was a kind man. He was funny, he cared about people, he cared about ideas, mental models, and the quality of thought. He, did, he cared about learning, and he didn't care where that learning came from. So, okay, much, that, that instantly sounds much better, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I thought of him uh, when it came time to give this talk because uh, the idea of a thinking cowboy uh, I think he would like this place where a bunch of curious people gather in a strange building to discuss things that excite them. This is the uh, application that we'll be working with. I have uh, on my local run server over here. Yeah, he's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have this a, a application running on my local run server, uh, which we'll, the, the application serves up Will Rogers quotes and we will be, over the course of the next little while, incrementally improving it with some modern tools and uh, front-end techniques. Okay. okay, so let's get started on uh, looking at the actual Django project. Uh, the app itself is pretty simple. It has one app called Quotes, uh, which contains a model representing each quote, a view uh, that serves up the model, and an admin page that lets users add, remove, or edit quotes. The view, going back to the view, the view itself uh, retrieves a random object from the database and passes it into the template context before rendering. The template itself uh, makes reference to three static assets. Uh, we have a uh, custom CSS style sheet to make the app look a little bit better. We have a CDN supplied jQuery, and we have a JavaScript uh, a file that contains all of our user interactions. Uh, the interactions within that JavaScript file are relatively simple. The app ensures that a user is paying enough attention to one quote before move, allowing it, them to move on to the next one. If you have not waited 10 seconds, then you receive an obnoxious alert ask, uh, telling you to please wait more for the next, uh, the next update. Uh, if the user has waited, then uh, window.location.reload is called, and the user gets a new randomly generated quote. Uh, pretty, sim pretty simple, and uh, it's going to be fun to remake it. This is my favorite quote. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Sorry. Um. Sorry. First, uh, the first thing that I want to mention about this app is that this app is perfect. Uh, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with this app. Every, we are gonna be going through five steps to make it incorporate five different tools. Each one of those is absolutely over-engineering and total overkill. And I'm not just saying that because this is a dummy proxy app that I made for the conference. You're going to encounter apps throughout your daily life where someone is gonna come across and say like, yeah, we really need to add view into this, or geez, that, that really should be handled by a build process. And the answer is not necessarily yes. The answer is going to be oftentimes it works totally fine. That is added complexity and mental overhead and we should not have to think about it. Part of learning these tools is figuring out where they directly apply. So my hope is that by giving you guys a taste into some of these tools that you will uh, better learn where to apply them and also maybe have some ammunition in your pocket when an overzealous person on your team decides they really must have the, the latest, shiniest toy. Okay, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is add uh, a front-end package manager to the app. We are gonna add NPM. NPM stands for the Node Package Manager. Node is the front-end uh, runtime, sorry, the back-end runtime environment that makes back-end JavaScript possible. NPM is the package manager for Node. Uh, it's pretty directly comparable to pip in the Python world in, in that it's used to download and install and keep track of external dependencies. For that reason, I think this is an easier sell for a lot of Django developers. Uh, if your only front-end de uh, dependency is jQuery, 
similar with uh, packages and apps that you're developing in the future. Uh, even if you aren't using tween for animation, moment.js for time, and Axios for making asynchronous requests, uh, having a requ having a package.json file in your project uh, does a lot to give new new uh, contributors to your project an understanding of what it is that you'll be doing. Okay, so how do you use it? Uh, to get started with it, you have to first have an up-to-date uh, version of Node installed on your computer or server, and then you initialize it uh, from the project directory with npm init. From then on, any commands you run to install the library, uh, install libraries are contained within package.json and package-lock.json files. You don't have to run the equivalent of pip freeze because dependencies are automatically saved to package.json as soon as you save the file, as soon as you run the command. Okay, so uh, let's add a couple of dependencies into our project first. Uh, first, we know we're going to be using jQuery, so we install that by running npm install jQuery. Once that finishes downloading, you can see that our a package.json ha uh, file has been modified. I don't include that, sorry. Uh, uh, has been modified, and that we have now generated a new folder called node modules, which contains the actual files that you've downloaded through the package manager. Uh, adding in another library called normalize.css, we will be incorporating both those into the project. Um, let's see. Looking inside of node modules, uh, you can see that, that that is where the actual jQuery installs have uh, taken place. This is kind of a quick and dirty way of getting node modules into uh, a Django application, and uh, a lot of my teammates who are better front-end developers than I have uh, are totally aghast by this. The, the idea here is that you're taking the entirety of the node modules directory and treating it as a static, as a static folder. Uh, in doing so, your collect static is going to be gigantic. You are going to suddenly be moving thousands of files into your collect static directory. And this is a step that, once you have uh, become a little bit more comfortable with Webpack, is not the right way to do it. But in the meantime, if you are just hoping to get some, uh, dip your toes into, front of, into uh, keeping, keeping track of your packages within, pack, within NPM, this is... Uh, as good of a stepping stone as I had found. So within settings.py, we declare node modules as a static directory. Um, having done this now, we can, within our templates, reference files that are contained within the node modules folder. Uh, you can see here that we are now referencing normalize.css within the template, and we have replaced the script tag that was referencing the CDN hosted jQuery with uh, now our self hosted jQuery that is served up from the node modules directory. Okay, and with that, uh, newbies who are coming into the project will be able to understand uh, the different JavaScript dependencies that you're using. You're keeping track of them for yourself, and uh, you have more independence for later on pursuing different parts of the project. Uh, we have successfully incorporated node modules and NPM into this already perfect app. Hooray! Uh, next up is we're gonna take the CSS file and we're going to uh, pass it through CSS preprocessors. Uh, for this one, we're going to be using SAS. Uh, the uh, other common ones, less is uh, um, the syntax of less. If you've learned SAS uh, or less, learning the other one, it will be uh, minutes of reference. Uh, stylus, a little bit, a little bit different, but uh, still very similar concepts. Basically, just uh, all three of these are a very smart person having decided how they want uh, what capabilities should have initially been built into CSS, and then writing programs to enable that sort of syntax. Let's look at our initial CSS file. Uh, you don't actually have to uh, read it here, but I've, I've divided up the file into two different parts. Uh, you can kind of see that there, because it's such a limited file, there aren't too many issues with it, but we can maybe see some areas for improvement. Um, our selectors uh, for the button, we have a whole host of different items that are referencing button, button hover, button Mozilla, uh, fo inner focus hover, button image, button button text. Um, same thing over there too, uh, referencing different parts within wrapper, uh, wrapper h1 and wrapper attribution. Uh, the ability to nest those would be kind of nice. Another uh, thing that, for example, we're we are referencing colors in multiple places. Uh, you can see up there the BBDDFF, uh, as well as over in the uh, button hover state, we use the same color. 
uh, it would be less error prone if we can store those in variables. Okay, so uh, how do you do it? First, oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, that's why you might want to do this. Um, having rewritten the file within uh, SAS syntax, it will look relatively similar to the point where, to the point where someone who hasn't taken the time to uh, learn SAS would still be able to pick up on what it's doing. Uh, the main focus here is on nested selectors. You can see that uh, the button element on the right side is uh, taking away from the need to reference button hover, button most uh, focus center, button image, and button text. Uh, and you can also see that we're now using a light blue variable, which we declare uh, higher up in the file. Okay. Um, once, once you have run, uh, once you've uh, created this, the, or even before you've created this, one uh, very useful thing about CSS preprocessors is that anything that is valid CSS is also going to be valid SAS or valid less. Uh, you can pass a, your normal CSS files through a preprocessor, and if you so desire, the, uh, if you wanted to do nothing but uh, p pass it through for practice or pass it through because you wanted a very uh, indirect way of minifying your CSS file, those are totally valid ways of doing so. Um, okay. I said in the beginning that jumping into front-end development doesn't uh, have to be an all-or-nothing thing. Adding these tools in one by one uh, and recognizing the pain points that they bring you uh, can be a very modular pr uh, process. Um, this next one is a good example of that. Uh, browser Sync is a uh, utility that the React and Vue and Angular world uh, they take advantage of that we can have within the Django world as well. Um, let's see if I can get this up and running. Uh, I'll show you a nice little fun example of hot module reloading here. Uh, do do please hold. Where my terminal windows go? Do do. There we go. Cool. So let's grab this command that I was running earlier today. Start of the run server. Okay. And just for fun, now let's crack open another terminal here. Present Hayden. Let's edit. So uh, what we're doing right here is you can see we're running on port 3000 instead of port 8000. I also have port 8000 running. Uh, that is the default Django run server. But uh, the lowest impact way I found to get browser sync and hot module reloading, uh, which is not technically what we're doing here, but getting uh, faster reloading into your projects uh, is to run browser sync within a proxy flag. So when we do that, now if, for example, I were to take this uh, CSS file, and let's say I just wanted to make it change, change the color. I save the CSS. I change the CSS. I change the CSS file. I don't change the CSS file. I miss my keyboard, guys. <laughs> and uh, you don't need to reload the page anymore. This can be a very useful tool for kind of iterative uh, development. If you decided, well, let's see how the page would look with maybe a little bit more padding. Do I like that? Yeah, let's see how we like it with even more padding. Yep. It, uh, it makes your front-end development process uh, quite a bit faster. So uh, nice, not, not a game changer, nice little tool to have. OK, let me get back to my presentation. Okay. Um, next up, uh, we are going to add Webpack into this project. Uh, Webpack is a build process manager. It, it uh, accomplishes similar goals that you would see within something like browser, uh, Browserify, Gulp, or Grunt. Uh, like the uh, more basic libraries that we were using earlier, it is installed by NPM. What it is useful for is it bundles different front-end assets together. 
Uh, so for example, you can divide up your JavaScript files into separate files, which is what we'll be doing uh, as part of this step here. It also helps you manage your uh, non-code dependencies. You can keep track of your font files, your images, uh, different resources that are maintained by the front end of the application, and uh, gives you a nice way of, mod of declaring what happens when you're building out your project. Um, one of the things that always bothered me when I was writing JavaScript in the old way was the global declar declaration of variables. If I wanted to break my code up into multiple files, uh, I needed to write my code with uh, keeping in mind the ordering of script tags rather than uh, keeping track of what delineations and breaks within my code made sense to me. That struck me as a limitation imposed by the browser, and it is something that uh, Webpack makes a, li a little bit easier. The, uh, the appeal to a Python developer is also pretty basic here, where uh, in Python, everything that we're going to be importing into a file is uh, everything that we want to use in a file uh, is imported at the top of the file. Um, our imports become authoritative, trustworthy sources of truth on where different, piece, uh, different pieces of code are being used throughout the code base. If we're not sure if a library is in use, uh, we can search our code for the imports. If all of your JavaScript code is built out with JavaScript imports, managed and bundled through Webpack, then you get the same peace of mind within your own project. You no longer have to worry about breaking something when moving around script tags, uh, because your JavaScript has independent sources, with, uh, because each of your JavaScript files is an independent source of information that has everything that it needs. I will say, um, what I mentioned before about adding different, pro different uh, front-end utilities to a project applies maybe 20 times for Webpack. Uh, if you are concerned about the complexity for a, uh, new, for a person who's new to front-end development, uh, evaluate within your project whether Webpack is right for you. The benefits are, you know, can, can be great. Uh, it is added complexity. And uh, we'll walk through the example of how to incorporate this into our much smaller app. Uh, for those of you who have, for example, say hypothetically, if you had like 3,000 line jQuery files that you're too afraid to touch at work, then uh, you can maybe see how this would be, this would be problematic. <laughs> that was a uh, personal experience. We are currently sorting through a 3,000 line jQuery file that we're also too afraid to touch because it is used by everyone. Um, so how do we use it? Uh, the first thing we do is we make a webpack.config.js file. This uh, was the simplest one that I could think to write. What we're doing right here is we are taking a single file called uh, index.js contained within a source directory, and we are outputting it to a file called bundle.js, which is going to live at the root of our project within a folder that we are calling dist. Uh, both the convention of storing your output within dist and keeping all of your source files within a folder called src uh, are conventions that we are borrowing graciously from the node community. OK, uh, first step is uh, you install Webpack as well as the command line interface through NPM. Uh, you find no vulnerabilities, and you're good. Uh, while doing node development, you do get scarily good at ignoring different warnings, but I've been told by very smart people that this one is totally fine for me to ignore. <laughs> Uh, once, we've done, sorry, once we've done that, uh, we can look at our uh, package.json file, which uh, contains new references to the Webpack and the Webpack CLI dev dependencies. Um, while, you can while you can structure a requirements.txt file in Python however you'd like, uh, not everyone follows the convention of dividing up dependencies into requirements and test requirements or requirements and dev and staging requirements. Uh, in, the, in the NPM world, uh, that is a little bit more clearly delineated where you are, I'm sorry, where if you install things with the dev flag, they are installed into a totally separate dependency. And the advantage of that is that then Node is able to figure, NPM is able to figure out while you're, sorry, Webpack is able to figure out while you're bundling up your project whether or not, uh, which projects to incorporate into the bundle. Um, the other thing that I'll reference over here is that um, in NPM land, the command line utility gives you access to NPM run blank. Uh, if, you are, if you add anything into this scripts uh, JSON, part of the JSON right here, 
these become commands that are aliased out to uh, different parts of, to whatever system commands you might want to run. So this gives you a very nice nifty interface for being able to specify all of the commands that you're running as part of your project. Uh, in this example, when we run npm run build, what I really want it to do is to run webpack with the flag of mode set to production. And uh, you can all see a, a test flag there. Uh, I have not incorporated any test coverage into this app, and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so let's see how this works. Um, in the beginning of this, uh, you can see that I do not have a dist folder. I run npm run build. Webpack does wonderful magic for me, which takes in, sorry, which takes in my source index.js file, and it outputs it into uh, the dist folder. Uh, as a precursor to that process, I have copied over my uh, JavaScript from the original app, the quote.js one, that very helpfully and informatively tells people that they have not looked at the quote for long enough and uh, moved it into this source directory, which now lives in the dist directory because Webpack. The next part of incorporating this into my Django project is that I list it as a static file directory. Now everything that lives within our final build directory, uh, aka dist, is going to be able to be referenced from within static files. I can then incorporate that into my template. Uh, I can replace the, both the reference to our self-hosted jQuery and my custom quote.js JavaScript with a single tag for bundle.js because now bundle.js contains everything that I need. If you care about, uh, you know, and uh, to some extent everyone should care, the, if you care about the size of the uh, JavaScript that your application is generating because you're in an environment where people don't have time to wait around for, you know, plus one second for the page to load, uh, this is a great way to bring down the size of your assets and uh, can be compartmentalized to divvy up the, the JavaScript files so that they're only downloaded when they're needed. And then if not, uh, if, you don't if you truly don't care about the uh, download size and performance of your uh, front-end application as far as uh, making big files is concerned, this is still a better way to develop. Uh, you are no longer relying on globally scoped variables scored within, uh, stored within the web browser. You don't have to worry about if in some random file you decide to declare dollar sign as a variable that jQuery would break. Uh, it, opens up to a little bit more security that on the back end side of things we take for it granted. Uh, talking about how I break, up, break apart this file, this is the, uh, the function that I had previously that tells me whether or not a user has waited for long enough. Uh, it is a pretty basic function that just takes in uh, the time that the user loaded up the page, figures out the JavaScript equivalent of a date time time delta, and then uh, returns back whether that has, it has been 10 seconds. Uh, the interesting part here is this export on the other side of things. That is a uh, newer uh, part of JavaScript uh, that is incorporated within uh, both Webpack and Node itself uh, to be able uh, to enable you to split your files up across different imports. By declaring an export on an individual function right here, within this next function, I'd be able to use JavaScript import syntax to specify that I want that function to be imported. Uh, I'm also saying that I am going to request uh, jQuery as available at the dollar sign variable so that I can keep most of my code to be similar. Uh, having done this, you can see that my code is, it was, it was never unmanageable, now it is even more manageable. So, nice to have. Um, let's look at this now that my JavaScript lives across two different files. Uh, you can see that what, MP, what Webpack is doing when I build this when I build this together is it is taking both my index.js and my utils.js and one mysterious hidden module, which I don't, it's, it's, it's jQuery, dude. You know it's jQuery. Uh, and it is outputting all of that into bundle.js. The end result is that I have a bundle.js that is basically the exact size of minified jQuery plus a little bit for the code that I've written. Um, yeah. The end result is a smaller and faster uh, download for the end user and a better, safer development experience for us. Hey!
All right, last uh, tool that we're going to be incorporating as part of this. Uh, I'm going to show you how to put a little React component into our app, uh, because I was worried that anyone thought that we had not over-engineered this enough. That <laughs> the, uh, I don't think I've actually shown you the uh, app in action yet, but basically, if you uh, have the app running, oh, look, it's still got a nice, beautiful uh, pink background now instead. Um, the, the app loads up a different one. And then if I click give me another one, it tells me this very irritating, aggravating message. Two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, Mississippi. OK. Now it gets me another quote. That's right. He was a contemporary of Einstein, by the way. Uh, lived in the early 1900s. <laughs> Um, anyway, so this button right here, the give me another cowboy button, is the one that we are going to be replacing with uh, a React component. Uh, at this point, most people have heard about React. Uh, it is fancy. It's nice. Um, it, is a it is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. It is written using an HTML JavaScript-y uh, hybrid syntax called JSX. And it works by creating different components that live on a web page. Uh, a React app begins by having one single root document uh, for each part of the React app that you're going to have. For example, you could have uh, two different divs on your page with different IDs and load two totally separate React applications into either of those. But the way that uh, React uh, declares itself is that you just specify I'm giving you a div on the page. React, this is your job. This is everything else outside of the page. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is make sure that that thing looks, be, looks, contains, and behaves according to user interactions exactly as expected. Um, let's see. If, React, uh, if you are evaluating whether to uh, put React into your project, um, I will say that there are a couple of signs for when React might be a good fit. Uh, if a user is doing something on the page that is changing five different val values, and each of those has a, a different vanilla JavaScript or jQuery function that you've written, uh, keeping track of those using React might be a little bit more efficient. Uh, if you are uh, trying to do an incredibly complicated user interaction. You know, you're, you need to keep track of the state that, that a user has uh, done within, within that, uh, the state of all the things that a user has done. Then uh, React or Angular or Vue. Personally, I like Vue. Uh, Vue is my favorite uh, UI framework. Uh, those can be, uh, pretty, those are pretty good signs for when you might want to incorporate React into your project. And then uh, finally, if you can uh, maintain pretty much everything using uh, API calls back to a server. Every user interaction is stored on, is stored on the server, and then either uh, you know Django JSON views or totally re-rendered content can be returned from uh, API endpoints. Those are all totally fine ways to build out your application. But if you are struggling to maintain the state of a user's interactions upon page load, one potential solution to this could be to do away with the, the very concept of page loads and make it so that your React app is aware and benevolently keeping track of your users' interactions at any given point. But also maybe not. Uh, React is not intuitive. React is uh, hard to learn, and that applies for most, library, most UI libraries out there. Uh, we had, we had Backbone installed on an app at work for a while, and uh, we everyone just kind of avoided it like the plague. You know, we thought every time it's working, we don't go near it. Uh, we and people just didn't want to take the time to learn how to use it. It is uh, mental and cognitive overhead, and uh, it may not suit your purposes properly. That applies so many times over to the uh, concept of an app that just displays a random Will Rogers quote. This is uh, very much an overkill app, and it would be totally silly to build a React component to do that. But I like silly things, so we're going to do that. Um, we are going to replace that little button on the bottom with a React component. Um, yeah. First thing we're going to do is install two libraries. The first is React, 
uh, which is the actual library that we'll be building out our components with. And the second is React DOM, which is the library that React uses for latching on to different parts of the, of the DOM, the document object model used within your browser. Uh, we are going to be writing this using that uh, HTML, -E, JS, -E, weird language, JSX that I was talking about before. Uh, your browser doesn't know how to read JSX, so this is going to, uh, we are going to need to also install another library called Babel, which is, uh, and accompanying libraries for tying it into React. All of the above are utilities for making it so that when Webpack encounters a JavaScript file written with, written with React, it is, a, is going to be able to process that into our dist folder and produce something that our browser is actually able to understand. Uh, this is what our new Webpack configuration looks like. The, uh, everything below line eight is new here. The way that we've configured Webpack in this instance is to say that anything containing JS or JSX is going, except for things in the node modules directory, is going to encounter the following rule. Uh, send it through the program known as Babel Loader uh, with the preset of React. That is us saying, every time you hit a J JSX file, send it through Babel with React. Uh, let's see. The next thing we do is we go back into our template and we wipe away everything that we had there previously for the uh, button. This uh, line 20 is now the exclusive and sole domain of React. React is going to be helping maintain the state and the display of this at any given time. And uh, we don't, Django templates are no longer going to have to worry about whatever is on, in there. And this is what a React component looks like. Uh, this is, uh, we are importing React using the uh, similar syntax that we saw before uh, in our newly modularized JavaScript. Uh, we are creating, if, for, uh, pass over the export default for a moment, and this looks almost a little bit Pythonic to say we, are, we have a class that is extending another class, and then it contains the following attributes. Uh, export default just enables us to load this in from a different file then. Um, the a React component uh, is initialized with a state, which we are declaring here. We're telling it that uh, you're going to start off with a state equal to uh, a JavaScript object containing the t a, a key of start and a value of when the, the a, t a date object for when the object was created. And we are going to tell React that uh, you are going to be using a method called handle click. Within the render function, we this is what uh, JSX looks like. You can see it's almost almost entirely HTML. The main differences are that because we are not going to be using uh, using the click keyword, uh, we are not able to actually use on click because it is a reserved keyword. Uh, we are instead uh, declaring it with this kind of bumpy syntax. Uh, and then we are able to actually pass in what is a, an expression that is evaluated as JavaScript here. Um, anything within curly braces in a React component is understood to be JavaScript. So that's kind of a, you know, I think when you're working in the Django templating language, this uh, idea of being able to, or, you know, Django templating language or PHP or really any uh, handlebars in JavaScript, uh, being able to drop into code is something that we take for granted, but uh, it is nice to be able to have one way of doing it and React, uh, as well as Vue components and Angular components, all give you a really nifty hint, uh, syntax for doing so. Uh, and then finally, we are declaring, uh, I'm, I have declared this React component as a class-based component, so it has a method called handle click. Uh, when this button is clicked, the handle click method is called. What is the handle click method? It's basically the same thing as we were seeing before. The uh, end result here, the end result here is that uh, we have a component that does exactly the same thing. Um, and I think the only thing that I did not uh, properly show you there The other thing I forgot to show you here is within our source index.js file, uh, how we are using the React DOM method. Uh, 
the our initial file, we were able to comment out the uh, event listeners, which would have otherwise made the event trigger twice because it does still have the ID. Uh, so we commented all that out. And then we import React, both React and React DOM at the top of the file. And then tell React DOM, I have made something called a next button component. And I want you to load that into the element note with the ID of next button, which if you'll remember from uh, quote templates is this thing that we have told it to stop caring about right here. So that is how we tie in our Django templates into a React component. Um, because I have been talking a lot about React because it's a useful uh, way of uh, getting people excited about front-end development. I have not. Uh, mentioned Vue quite as much, but if you were curious about how to build this out as a Vue component, uh, it would look like so. There, um, Vue has a weird uh, definition of separation of concerns. Uh, with React, everything kind of lives jumbled together. In Vue, everything also lives jumbled together in the same file, but within separate tags. Uh, you can see that that template tag at the top of the file is analogous to an HTML import. Uh, or to an, the HTML portion of your file. The script tag is uh, analogous to the user, user experience in the JavaScript of your file. And that very tiny non-existent uh, style tag at the bottom of the file is useful, uh, is where you could put your CSS rules. Um, I like that this allows you to store all of your component, everything about a component within one set package. Uh, I don't have great internal memory. Uh, my head does not keep things in it very long. So the ability to think of my code as you have this big application and it's made of littler stuff that happens here and you don't have to worry about bleed over from those uh, is valuable to me. So what I like about this single line, uh, single file view component is that this is my button. There are many like it, but this is my button. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you can see kind of the syntax is uh, not, it's not, it's not intuitive, you have to learn it, but uh, once you do, uh, and I'll get to be that person who tells you, you know, if you have not done any front-end development before, like, trust me on the other end of it, it, it does make sense. Oh, right, I killed my presentation. Uh, You know, the last thing I had was a thank you slide anyway, so I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this my thank you slide. <laughs> thank you, Robert. This was really impressive and not over-engineering at all. I really like this. this is, <laughs> I could follow it along, and this was really helpful. Thank you. Um, other questions? Going once. Yes. Uh, this is not really a question. Could I ask you if it's a comment or something? Could I ask you to sort it out afterwards? I, unless you have a question, actual question. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you can jeopardyify it, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I had the pleasure of over-engineering my first React app because the first engineer chose Redux for like a chart-based small app, and it was a huge lane down that hole. Uh, but how do you f figure out when th that over-engineering point is applicable? Um, and then state management, there's so many options for like all these different things. So it's without the experience, it's really hard to tell. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the question was uh, when, regarding specifically the concept of state management, when do you figure out if, over -engineer, if you are over-engineering it by incorporating additional libraries, uh, for example, Redux or Vuex or, uh, I don't know what Angular, I guess you can use Flow. Redux with Angular. Oh, cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, MobX. Uh, 
when is it uh, over engineering to incorporate those into your project? Um, I didn't, I deliberately did not talk about Redux during this. Uh, it is an incredibly useful concept. Uh, the, basically, the, the idea is that your components not, uh, they do manage their own state, but they also are, have a way of interacting with your application's global state. So for example, like if you think of Facebook, the go-to example is uh, someone checks, checks a message and then suddenly the counter of number of unread messages needs to decrement by one and the message needs to show a different CSS class and on the other side of the page that message needs to no longer be bolded. Uh, those all had to be, would otherwise have to be passed back and forth between different components. Uh, keeping a global state sc store can be a very useful way of having one single source of truth for what has happened in your application. Uh, my answer for the over-engineering aspect is one, practice comes with experience, go for it. Uh, but two, if you, are, if you have anything where the user can get themselves into a state where there are a lot of things going on on the page, that's probably a good candidate for a state management library. Cool, thanks. Hello, thank you very much. This was very enlightening. Um, you have been the third speaker today, I believe, to mention Webpack as a tool for managing uh, node uh, build and dependencies. Uh, you have been the first, as far as I noticed, to notice that it wasn't the first such tool, that there was Grunt and Gulp and uh, other things. And uh, as a, a primarily backend developer who shies away mostly from the front end because the landscape there keeps changing all the time. I have to ask, are we there yet? Is, is Webpack it? <laughs> um, I, one thing that I neglected to mention throughout this uh, whole talk is that the biggest asset for me has been that on my team we hired a uh, senior front end developer who has been an incredible learning resource and he is a huge advocate of uh, using Gulp as the build process manager. Uh, I think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a there yet thing. I think it is a code versus configuration thing. If you prefer to have a standardized set, a way of specifying within your Webpack file, these are the things that I want to do and I want it to be one JSON file and I want it to ha I want there to be a right way of doing things and please don't make me think about this anymore and let me go back to coding, then Webpack is a good answer for that. If you do want to dive deep down into the way that your build process operates and maybe even add some custom configuration using JavaScript, uh, that then Gulp is a great tool for that. Uh, I say that reluctantly because it is truly confusing to have so many tools out there, but uh, for me personally, I fall into the school of, I just need, I have other things that I'd like to be thinking about and Webpack works totally great. Uh, it's the one that you get by default with Create React App and it plays nicely with Vue, so uh, I, I, I give that my full endorsement. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm just curious, is Grunt actually like an alternative to Webpack? Because from my understanding, Webpack does bundle up uh, JavaScript and images and CSS files. <laughs> and Grunt is like a task runner, so it's usually used to execute Webpack. Are there, like, what other uh, projects are that are a real alternative to Webpack and not just, like, used to run it? That's true. Uh, Webpack does, uh, one of the main selling points of Webpack is that it does uh, say, we will not only be managing your JavaScript, we'll be managing all of your front-end assets, your, C your CSS, your images, your fonts, um, and sending those through a uh, standardized pipeline. Uh, there are there are tools that you would then incorporate into Gulp that allow. And I'm sorry, I've never worked with Grunt, so I'm not going to uh, talk about Grunt so much. But uh, you can incorporate parts of uh, different uh, tools into Gulp, so you're no longer building out a full-on monolithic solution for how you can manage your your dependencies. Uh, sorry, your build process. Instead, you are telling uh, from this Gulp file conditionally run this different command. Uh, if you're looking for the one-shop solution, which I think is is not a disparaging thing, one-stop one shops are great, uh, then Webpack is uh, a pretty good solution for that. But there, I have not encountered something that a smart person couldn't also do in Gulp. 
Thank you for your excellent presentation. Imagine that you are able to make me understand it. It is <laughs> extraordinary. However, uh, even your extraordinary work in uh, bringing all of that front-end tools to Django, you maintain the approach of the monolithic Django. What's your view on decoupling the back-end of Django using an API um, uh, interface and using React or whatsoever as a completely different approach? Yeah, the, uh, the dirty secret of this presentation is oh, I deleted it. Never mind. Uh, I had some I had some Django REST framework serializers in here as well. Um, it's when I first started doing this, I almost felt a little dirty for not doing J the things the Django way. Uh, if you uh, the the, basic, the question is uh, using React and Vue, it is possible to. Uh, decouple your application such that you no longer need the Django templating language. Uh, you don't need to use Django routing anymore. And you, you basically just turn Django into a headless system for building out APIs. And then you build out uh, your application with React and Vue, or React or Vue or Angular. Um, that architecture makes a lot of sense in a lot of places. Uh, the Django templating language is incredible, and it is great for many tasks. And I would evaluate whether the additional complexity of React or Vue, especially for us people who know Django, uh, is worth it. Um, and the answer to that is going to oftentimes be no. But uh, you can maybe imagine an app that has very complicated user experience uh, intricacies to it, in which case, uh, we don't have to give up our full stack. Luckily, Django is the best way I've encountered for building out an API. Uh, you know, doesn't, and by the way, it doesn't just has, have to be a REST API. Uh, Django Graphene is a great way of building out GraphQL API endpoints that uh, React developers just seem to love for some reason. Um, but I think that it's the decision to decouple your app is uh, one that adds a lot of complexity to your project and should be taken with a grain of salt. But it is a totally viable one, and once you are, if you are comfortable with a front-end uh, development library and you're comfortable with a uh, back-end web framework, then you know, world's your oyster. You can build you can build anything. All right. Um, are there any more questions in the room or on the web? No. Then thank you, Robert. Again. Thank you.